as we get ready to delve into the word, I wanna invite you to pause with me wherever you are and let's pray and let's ask that the Holy Spirit would help us to receive his word today, the message that God has already prepared for us so that we might see the power of God in our lives. So wherever you are, I wanna ask you to pause and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we know that you are a living, breathing, moving God. We know that your word is not static, but that it is alive and inspired. So as we bring this series to a close, we ask that as we look at the word for today, that you would give us the eyes necessary to see what's on the page, that you would give us a heart that is receptive to your word, and that even if you challenge us, that we wouldn't be quick to dismiss it, but that we would be ready to receive this challenge. God, we know that you're going to do an amazing work today, and we thank you in advance for that. We pray all of this in the loving name of Jesus. Amen. So back on January 1, we started the sermon series that we are ending today, and we've called it The Transforming You. When we began the year, we didn't simply want to give you a sermon series about the five steps to your best life ever. We didn't want to give you the seven-step strategy to become the best you you've ever been your entire life. Now, don't get me wrong. Those things are really good. You should be intentional with your life. You should try to plan your life and make goals. Be intentional. Go for it, right? Reach for the moon, and even if you fail, you'll fall upon the stars, right? But what we realized here at the Bolingbroke Church is that we wanted to bring you to Scripture. We wanted to bring you to the living, breathing, inspired Word of God and really look at how God works in our lives, how God shapes us and transforms us and, and takes our past, the sins in our lives, our failures, those moments of deep shame, and how God can redeem that. God can transform that. God is not afraid of our past. Instead, God can sit in the muck of the darkest moments in our lives and His light can transform even the worst moments in our lives. That God can take our mess and turn it into a message that will bless others that have gone through the same thing you've gone through. So you may look back on your past and, and think that you because of what you've gone through, you're not worthy, you're not lovable, you're not good enough. And yet God looks at the past you've been through and says, if you let me, I can transform and redeem you. And if you haven't had a chance to, to watch all of the other eight sermons in this series, today, after this one is done, just go on ahead and binge watch all of them. Listen, we binge watch Netflix, Amazon Prime, trilogy movies, podcasts. We binge on so much. Why not binge on sermons and then see what your life looks like, what God reveals to you after six hours of spending time in the Word? I guarantee you that God will do something powerful if you were to do that. But with all of that said, let's, let's come back. To what's happening today. We are coming to the end of a series that I believe in my own life has even changed the way I see my own faith. You know, sometimes we look at pastors, we, we're the ones that are up in front preaching or on the camera preaching, and we have this way of almost putting our pastors on a pedestal. Oh, that pastor, he prays every day. He reads his Bible every day. He wakes up early in the morning. He, he prays all night. He's really good with his words. He, he's really good with the Bible. And we put these past pastors on a pedestal. But what I've learned is that a pastor is still in need of transformation. I once read a quote that says that the greatest thing a leader can bring to his organization is his own transforming self, which means that we are constantly being changed and transformed. And if a path, it's true for a pastor, then it's true for everyone. The best thing that you can bring to your marriage to your children, to your family, to your work, to your neighborhood, to the mall, to the gym, to your friends, is your transforming self, which means that you are someone that is continually coming to the presence of Jesus and asking God to change you. And today, I hope that by the end of this, some of you will feel more free in your relationship with Jesus. 
It's my prayer that for some of you, you're going to see for the first time a new vision of life. So I'm going to ask you to turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And we're going to start in verse 12. The Bible tells us, Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. But their minds were made dull, for to this day the veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed, because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. A veil is anything that obstructs our vision to see what's on the other side of the veil. A veil keeps us from being able to see reality as it is. I don't know about you, but these last couple of days with the rain and the snow, if you're driving out there, sometimes that acts almost as a veil because you can't truly see everything. I mean, you can see it, but it obstructs your view a little bit. And so Paul right here, he is writing and he is telling this church in the city of Corinth, he is saying, there are some of you who even though you're reading the Bible, you have the, because up until this point, they only had the Old Testament. But he says, you're reading the Bible, and yet you're still missing the point. You're reading the first five books, the books of Moses, which is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. You're reading all of this. You're reading the Old Testament, but you're missing the point. You're not actually seeing what's there because the entire Old Testament was simply foreshadowing the coming of Jesus. The Old Testament was there to prepare us to receive Jesus when he finally came. And Paul in Corinthians is saying, listen, there are some of you who you are reading this word, but there is a veil that is obstructing your view of who Jesus is. See, because when Paul is writing this, Jesus was already crucified and resurrected. Jesus was already in heaven at the right hand of the Father. And so now he's saying, there are some of you who... You saw Jesus, but you don't believe in Him. You haven't accepted Him. You haven't given your life to Jesus. Because when Paul was writing, there was people that were still trying to earn their salvation. There was people that were trying to live by the rule of the law. And Paul says, the fact that you're trying to earn your salvation means that you haven't understood that the Bible was leading you. To Jesus. The Old Testament was leading you to Jesus. So when he says that when the Old Covenant is read, there's still a veil over your eyes because you haven't come to Jesus. You're still trying to earn your salvation. You see, they thought that if they just followed the rules and the regulations, that then they would be acceptable to God. But when Jesus comes, he says, listen, I know you can't keep the law. You can't keep all of, you can't even keep the Ten Commandments. So I will fulfill it for you, and I will provide eternal life. But Paul says there is a veil that's keeping you from seeing Jesus. There is a veil that is keeping you, obstructing your view of Jesus. And so we look back on this, and it's easy for us to judge them. Like, yo, how can you not know? that the Old Testament was pointing to Jesus. How can you not see that Jesus was resurrected? He is the Messiah. How could you not see that? But then it got me thinking. You know, there are times in our lives that we have veils that obstruct our relationship with Jesus. You see, what ends up happening in our lives here in America is that you know, we seek after professional advancement. We seek after financial freedom. We seek after hobbies. And we have a plethora and such a variety of things that we can do. We have distractions galore on our cell phones, on Netflix, on Amazon Prime, on Hulu, on Disney Plus, on Peacock, on... <laughs> That's the point. There is endless amount of distractions in our lives that without us knowing it, get in the way of our relationship with Jesus. So you may not be trying to earn your salvation like the people that Paul was talking about, 
But sometimes there are things in our lives that actually obstruct our relationship with Jesus. There are things in our lives that get in the way of us coming to the presence of Jesus on the daily. So Paul says, listen, we are not like Moses. Moses was on the mountaintop talking to God face to face for 40 days and 40 nights. And then when Moses came down off that mountain, the Bible tells us that his face was radiant that it was glowing, it was, it was shining because he had been in the presence of God. And the Israelites, when they saw him, they turned away. They were afraid and they said, Yo, Moses, cover your face. Cover your face. Now think about this, fam. There are moments in our lives where we act just like the Israelites, when instead of coming to the presence of Jesus, we cover over the presence of Jesus by all of the distractions we're chasing after. There are moments when we cover over the presence of Jesus in our lives by not coming to God in prayer, by not spending time in scripture, by not spending time in worship, by not coming to church and being with God's people. But there are times when we veil over the presence of God because there's something else we'd rather be doing And by virtue of doing that, we obstruct our relationship with Jesus. We all do it. No one is perfect. And so the question becomes, well, what do we do? What happens when we've put so many other things in between our relationship with Jesus? What do we do when we've put other things in front of Jesus? How will Jesus ever forgive us? And Paul says in verse 16, But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Whenever you turn to the Lord, whatever you've put as more important than Jesus, even if you didn't do it on purpose, but whenever you turn to Jesus, that obstruction is taken away. Like there is no better news that there's nothing you have to do to earn God's love. There's nothing you have to do to earn God's grace and blessing and mercy and salvation. Paul says, all you have to do is turn to Jesus and everything will be moved away. That's why when I pray for the sermon and I ask that God would clear away the distractions in our lives, it's because there's always things that are pulling us away from the moment. There's always something that seems more important. And what we are saying through prayer is what Paul is saying is, all you have to do is turn toward Jesus today. Remember I said that I'm going to leave you with one thing that helps the transformation process, and that's it. Fix your eyes on Jesus. That's all you have to do. And, And the way that we fix our eyes on Jesus is through prayer, is through Bible study, it's through our thoughts. And, and you can fill it in with sermons and, um, worship music and gathering together with other people and talking about God. Like, like, let's be real. It's simple. It's the word and it's prayer day in and day out. Because what happens when you make time for God in those spaces, what you're actually doing is you're fixing your eyes on Jesus. You're allowing the Holy Spirit's space in your life to speak life and truth. And Paul says, whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. People were trying to earn their salvation. And when you're living by the heaviness and the burden of rules and regulations, there's no freedom. But when you come to Jesus and you live by the Spirit, there is freedom. Relationship relationship with Jesus will lead you to freedom. But living by rules and regulations will only lead you to a burden of life. You know, when Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He says, take my yoke upon you, for it is light. What Jesus was saying is, follow the way that I, like, like take my teachings onto you. Live by the way that I am teaching, and you will find rest for your soul. 
Paul says, whenever you turn to the Lord, everything that was in the way will melt away because when you enter into the presence of God, he will give clarity to your life. So the five steps to the best you you've ever been your entire life or the seven steps to the best you you've ever had, if you can turn to Jesus first, he will guide you and give you the awareness you need as you move forward. So I'll show you some of the ways that we have these veils in our, in our lives. So one of the phrases that I picked up along the 40 years of my life, whenever I wake up in the morning and I'm feeling overwhelmed, whenever I feel anxious, whenever I feel like I'm not up to par to the thing, the assignment that is ahead of me, whenever I have these, these words and feelings of insecurity or inferiority in my life, I have this phrase that I've been saying for years, and it's, God, your grace is enough for me. And I used to think that it was this spiritual thing, like, God, your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. But I found myself saying that in moments where things didn't work out the way I wanted them to. I found myself saying it in moments where I was worried that the thing that I was about to do was going to fail. I did it in moments where it was almost like, man, I failed at this thing. Your grace is enough. It almost became like I was settling, but I didn't notice this until just a couple of days ago. I was at home in my office in the morning. I was reading through this passage, and then I realized for the first time in 40 years that, no, God's grace is not enough. That is not what I fall back to when things in my life don't work out the way I want them to. God's grace isn't just enough when I fail. God's grace isn't just enough when I sin. God's grace isn't just enough when my life isn't working the way I want it to. No, God's grace is everything. God's grace is everything. You see, my face was veiled. And now listen, I come to scripture on the almost on the daily. I pray every single day. I get up and preach and I feel like I am as close to God as I have ever been in my entire life. Every single day, a little bit more. But even in the words that I was saying, it was almost as though I was settling for second best when what Jesus was actually trying to tell me is like, no, if you make my grace everything in your life, I will direct your path. If you seek me above all, before all, before anything else in the world, I will direct your steps. I will guide you in this life and you will have the life you never dreamed of. But I was making Jesus second and my dreams first. And it was as though this veil was removed from my eyes just a few days ago when it was like, no, Jesus is everything. Your grace is everything. And Paul says, whenever you turn to the Lord, your blinders will come off. Everything that is in the way of your relationship with Jesus will will go away when you enter into the presence. And we won't be like those Israelites that were telling Moses, you'll cover up the presence of God. Like, could you imagine being able to just get a little bit of the glow of the presence of God Like, why would you reject that? Why would you want to cover over it? And yet we do that today. And I want to invite you in this moment to stop covering, stop veiling, stop obstructing Jesus in your life and just come and surrender to him today. Paul says, We all who with unveiled faces Behold the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. He says, we with unveiled faces. That's why he starts this passage by saying, we're not like Moses. We are bold. We are going to look at the presence of God. We are going to enter into the presence of God. And he says, we with unveiled faces, we're going to turn to Jesus and take everything else that is getting in the way because his grace is everything. And as we behold the Lord's glory, we are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory. Now, we've been talking about transformation all these weeks. And the one thing that we do in this entire process 
is simply turn toward Jesus and behold his presence. In the word and in prayer, behold his presence. Take in all of Jesus. Take in all of God's presence in your life and the Spirit will do the work of transformation. It says he will he will turn you into his image with ever increasing glory. It is happening to you through the Spirit and it is this progressive moment. You may not be changed in an instant in the twinkling of an eye. That happens when Jesus comes back to take us to be with him for all eternity. But the work of transformation is an ongoing work that the Holy Spirit does in your life. Doesn't mean that you're perfect overnight. Husbands and wives, it doesn't mean that if your husband or wife comes to Jesus, that all of a sudden he's gonna be perfect overnight, but the work begins instantly. And for some of us, it's the work of our entire lives that the Spirit works on us. But when it says that it happens with ever-increasing glory, it means that it is a continuous process. One of the founders of the Adventist Church, she wrote in a letter saying, By beholding, we become changed into His likeness, for we are complete in Him. By beholding, we are changed. Your, your gaze into the face of Jesus, fixing your eyes on Jesus through prayer and the Word is what changes you and makes you more into the image of Jesus. And she writes, we are complete in Him with ever-increasing glory. But if that's not enough, if that's not enough, that by beholding, by taking all of Jesus and by removing the things that get in the way, by removing the veils, by removing everything that is obstructing and getting our way in our relationship with Jesus, if that is not enough, I want to read to you the words of Jesus in John chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me, and I in them bear much fruit. Because apart from me, you can do nothing. We look at the words of Jesus, and when we want to get a deeper understanding of what it looks like to behold the glory of God, Jesus says, listen, just abide. Come to me. He says, I am the true vine, and you are the branches. Like you will only see the fruit of your faith if you remain connected to Jesus. And he says, those who remain connected to me will bear much fruit. But you know, within that passage, there is this, this phrase that sometimes we overlook. And he says in verse 2, every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. When we're talking about transformation, sometimes God prunes, God cuts, God ends things in our lives. And we know that with every ending comes a new beginning. And that's because God is working in your life. Sometimes he will remove something in your life because you get too complacent. And so God will take something away because he's waiting for you to get to the next thing that he has prepared for you. But because we've gotten too comfortable because we get too complacent in our lives. God's like, look, I know you're faithful. I know you're trusting in me. But you listen, you're too comfortable. I'm going to go ahead and cut some stuff out of your life. I'm going to prune some stuff so that your faith can continue to grow and flourish and become stronger. 
What does it mean to behold the glory of the Lord? It's to abide in Him, to come to Him above all else, before anything else. If we would just seek the presence of God, your life would be transformed. And it says that if you remain connected to God, you will bear much fruit, which is the biblical way of saying, because it's in metaphors, is that your life, you will see the fruit of your faith. Your trust in Jesus, you will begin to see how God provides. That through your trust in Jesus, you will begin to see the changes in your own life. You know, it's interesting. I have an example in my own life, but my wife can always tell when I haven't been spending time in the Word and prayer in the morning. So my wife knows that I'm a fairly impatient person to begin with. That's just the way I was made, I think. (laughs) But I'm kind of impatient. I don't have a short temper. I don't get angry or stuff like that. I just get annoyed really easily. But my wife knows that when I spend more time in the Word, more time in prayer, that I'm more patient, that I'm able to handle more stuff that would normally annoy me. And the likewise is true is that she knows when I haven't been spending it and she'll say things like, yeah, I think you need to make sure you're spending more time in the Word. My wife is my pastor. I don't have a pastor because I'm the pastor of this church. But my wife is who God uses to speak truth and life into my life. And sometimes she has to remind me that I haven't been turning to Christ. Sometimes she has to remind me that there is something that is obstructing my view and my relationship with Jesus. Whatever it is in your life, God wants to transform you from what the Bible says with ever increasing glory. The more you remain connected, the more you abide in Christ, the more you seek life in His presence, the more you will begin to see the transforming power of the Spirit of God. By beholding, you are changed into the likeness of Christ's image. For in Him, we are complete. In Him, we find true meaning and joy and purpose in this life. So what does it look like to be transformed? Is that with unveiled faces, we come before the Lord and behold His splendor. That's why it's so important for us to read scripture, specifically the gospels. The more you read the gospels and you meditate and reflect and contemplate the life of Jesus, the more you'll begin to see your own life changing. Because you can't be encountered by Jesus and stay the same. Every time you are encountered by Christ, you begin to change a little more with ever increasing glory from one moment of glory to the next. So as we bring this series to a close, if there's anything that you take away from this, is that if every single day you simply seek the presence of God, God isn't looking for someone to be perfect. God isn't looking for someone to follow all of the rules and regulations of the Old Testament. God is looking for someone to be in relationship with. The Bible says that eternal life is to know Christ whom God has sent. And that begins today. God wants relationship with you because he knows that by being in that relationship, he will be able to guide your steps because you trust him and he can lead you to the life that he has created for you. So you may find that you are the best person you've ever been your entire life by following Jesus. And you may also have the best year you've ever had every single year. But there's also going to be moments of pruning. There's also going to be moments where God has to cut things out of your life to move you to the next stage where He needs you to go. But if you will remain connected to Christ if you will behold the splendor of his glory, the light of his life will guide you every step of the way. I want to close with prayer. 
And I simply want to offer up a prayer for you. If you've had things that you've been putting between you and your relationship with Jesus, if you've obstructed your vision of Jesus in this moment, all you have to do is turn to him. And if you're ready to make that decision today, there's a link in the description box below. Click on it. I believe it says next steps and just let us know, look, I'm ready. I'm ready to give my life to Jesus. I, God has been pursuing me. I'm ready. It'll be the one decision that you will never regret. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we've been talking about the power of your transforming power in our lives. God, it is my prayer for those who are listening to this message that you would help them to remove the, not even help them to remove the obstructions. God, that you would just give them the power to turn to you. That with unveiled faces, they can behold and be changed into the ever growing glory of your likeness. Guide us, Father, fill us, mend us, heal us. We ask all this in the loving name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much for joining and tuning in with us today. If today was a blessing for you, we invite you to do three things. The first thing is to create a space for you here at Baldwinbrook Church. So subscribe to this channel and follow us and join us every single week as we have new messages and new content just for you. The second thing is to help create a space for people around you. Go ahead and share this video with your friends, with your family, coworkers, neighbors, anyone that you think would benefit from this message today. And lastly, if you have benefited from anything that's happening here at Bolingbrook Church, we invite you to pray, to partner with us with your giving and your resources in helping us create spaces for people all around the world. We really hope that you feel called and are willing. And if you are, go ahead and click on the giving description below because we have a special vision and mission here at Bolingbrook Church, and that is to create spaces for the people that God missed the most. And as a follower of Christ, I believe that you are a space creator too. So we hope that you continue to join our community and help create spaces where you are. Thank you for being a space creator.